All right, Laura. Laura, uh, where are you from originally? Where did you, you grow up? Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hmm. Born and raised. And tell me about your family. Um, Growing up. Middle class family. Um, I have younger siblings. I'm the oldest. Um, we I had a pretty good childhood um, up until about puberty. Um, I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, and that has caused me a lot of uh, emotional regulation problems and mental health issues. Um, and the PCOS and the hormonal disturbances. Um, I also uh, was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum when I was 11. So very high functioning um, autistic traits, but enough that it's caused a lot of friction to say the least um, with my family. Um, I have experienced psychological, emotional and verbal abuse from family members. Um, which has resulted in complex PTSD. Um, and that was not diagnosed until more recently. Um, I'm 26 now, and that wasn't diagnosed until age 22. So I had complex PTSD and attachment wounds um, and severely low self-esteem from the combination of uh, the autism and being, you know, socially alienated, um, having social problems. And then the PCOS causes a lot of depression and it, just anxiety. And then the PTSD from the abuse. So the PCOS. PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. You have cysts on your ovaries. Now you were born a... Female. You were born female. Yes. And you transitioned to... Male. Male. Yes. And you are back going back to female. Yeah, I've been living. Um, I've accepted my biological reality now for since I was 22. So living, you know, as a female, um, I don't I I'm just careful around the language that I'm using because I don't believe. You can you can pass as the opposite sex, but you can never really live as them and you can never become the opposite sex. So I was never male. I was just having an identity crisis and I was identifying with this illusion of becoming the opposite sex um, in order to escape the reality of being itself, especially being um, a depressed and traumatized young woman. So when I say I've been living as a woman, I mean, I've accepted my biological reality as a female um, person now since I was 22. And, and how much of your desire to be a man came from the the way you were treated as a by your family as, as a young child? Um, a significant portion um, came from really just the insecurity, just being you know when you're autistic but not but high functioning enough where. People just see you as kind of quirky and weird and depressed and they mostly just leave you alone and you can just get by in school. You're doing well in school, you know, intellectually, um, you know, above average intelligence, but socially behind. You really don't get any interventions. There aren't any interventions available to you. And so there's just layers and layers of alienation and then the insecurity and the pain and the shame that comes from the childhood um, abuse and feelings of emotional abandonment um, and not having safe con attachments or relationships or friendships with with anybody. Um, you know, it's I've been suicidal. Uh, I had suicidal ideation from the age of about 14, um, very severe. And so, you know, for suicidal ideation, you know, it's a combination of shame, self-hate, um, feeling hopeless and then feeling purposeless and disconnected. So when you have all of those elements chronically for years, just escalating and getting more severe as you develop into more, uh, more complex adult problems, um, you know, you become more and more desperate for, you know, a solution. And so I thought that, you know, obviously I had many complex problems. They all come back to essentially feeling unloved and unlovable 
and hopeless of ever being loved and not knowing how to um, access love within myself or sort of create loving connections or purpose. Um, and so that, those sort of existential things, you know, related to the abuse and related to the alienation and, and just being a very highly sensitive person, um, very neurotic, those things in combination led me to want to escape that reality. And I started having gender dysphoria, you know, symptoms of gender dysphoria, which is, um, you know, just basically a desire to be the opposite sex, to live as the opposite sex, to have opposite sex characteristics and loathing of an insecurity around your um, body and actual self. Uh, when I was about 15 or 16, I started identifying as gender queer when I was 16, which kind of meant, um, essentially it just means androgynous. Pretty much every single gender identity just means androgynous. Um, and, but gender queer, I was like, okay, I'm very queer, I'm quirky, I'm kind of weird and I'm androgynous. I used to be very um, tomboyish, you know, but when you're autistic, you're wearing really casual clothes, you know, and you, when you're depressed, you don't want to, you know, style your hair, or do anything, you know, so it's just um, very uh, butch sort of appearance for a long time. Um, and so I started to experience more and more self-hate and I started having feelings of gender dysphoria and becoming aware of the concept of gender dysphoria, because before that I was just I mean, all these symptoms are symptoms of many conditions. That's the thing about gender dysphoria is there's so many overlapping symptoms and traits that people often project all of these different traits and symptoms onto this one diagnosis that um, often can, is, is a sign of other things. Like I said, depression, anxiety, autism, PCOS, and uh, PTSD. So, um, I also then had more confusion when I was a teenager because I started having um, one-sided sort of situationships um, and unrequited loves for gay male friends of mine. And I had three consecutive instances of this. So kind of like love addiction stuff, um, you know. Which so you were attracted to gay men? I was attracted to men, um, but it's just that I happened to be friends with gay men, I guess, because I'm a creative person. I was friends with people who are like theater adjacent people and theater kids and stuff. So the gay men, I found a lot of camaraderie with them because we were creative, we were, um, you know, expressive, humorous, but also we were attracted to men. And I've, I'm a very um, passionate person. I'm a very um, sexual person. And uh, with PCOS and autism, it has a little bit more of a male typical sexual uh, proclivity. So for example, you know, how women typically don't watch porn as much as men or, you know, certain things. I had a very male, you know, like visual um, pornographic interest. I watched a lot of porn and I was very, um, very sexual, had a lot of sexual energy and, you know, very um, open about it, you know, humorous. And so I really fit in with that sort of gay male um, energy. And, you know, being sort of naive, you know, I guess I didn't have the experience to understand that women can also be, you know, especially women who are autistic or have uh, um, PCOS, more testosterone, um, they can be horny, you know, they can be um, very sexual. It doesn't mean that they're gay men or that they can't find a place as this type of woman. And that's essentially what it comes down to is I felt like I could not exist as myself. I felt that I was so alienated, so much shame, so kind of off from other people that there was no way that I would be able to integrate um, and find love and happiness as myself, as this type of woman, as a kind of funky person, a woman, female. And so I thought if I have to, if it's possible to change 
because, you know, it, there's a myth that it's possible to change. Um, and if you sort of believe that illusion that you can change and that gender doesn't matter, you know, sex doesn't matter, you know, it's a spectrum, all this sort of unscientific stuff, um, you're going to, you know, sort of feel like you can just pick and choose, you know, what you want to be, which is just not realistic. So I thought that I would be, I should be clear, I never believed that I was a man, like trapped in a woman's body. I felt like what would make the most sense, would be most prudent for me, would be to try to live as a gay man, that that would make sense to me with my personality and my um, sexual preference, my romantic preference. Um, and while there is some logic to that, obviously it's still impossible, number one, it's impossible. It's also very difficult and very dangerous medically um, and psychologically. And so essentially, I, you know, I am still, you know, a very funky woman. Um, I'm an artist and a writer and a musician. So eccentric artist is kind of my shtick. Um, my artist and musician name is Funk God. So like funkiness, you know, being offbeat, that sort of, that's my thing. And I've been able to embrace being a funky woman, a funky heterosexual woman who wants to get married and have like a traditional family at that, you know? So like really not that different than most women, but just growing up and you're autistic and you, you know, have experienced trauma and your brain is not um, developed and it doesn't have long-term planning. And it's also, you know, have PTSD um, and you hate yourself. You're desperate to try and, you know, find love, find community, find um, peace. And, you know, there also is a myth that if you don't transition and you have gender dysphoria, that you're going to kill yourself. And I was suicidal for a long time. And so I became desperate to solve all these complex issues. And part of it are existential. Part of them are unresolved childhood trauma. Part of them are just, you know, part of growing up and developing into an adult. Um, and so I was unfortunately able, I was fast tracked to be able to access medicalization uh, when I really should have been gate kept and I was not a suitable person to be medicalized. Um, so when I was 19, I went to an informed consent clinic which basically means you just walk in and you say you're trans and you want cross-sex hormones, testosterone. And they gave me a free prescription of testosterone that day. Um, even though I told them all these lists of, you know, being suicidal, all this, they still gave me that pretty much completely unregulated. Um, they just gave me a very high dose of testosterone, which is an experimental uh, substance. Um, and pretty much had no checks and balances. They just gave me the prescription and that's it. There was no doctor overseeing me, there was nothing. And I was suicidal and 19 and the testosterone, um, I injected it into my thigh every week and it had a lot of adverse effects um, on my mood. You know, as you could imagine, like <laughs> psychologically, it wasn't good for me. Um, I became even more angry reckless, um, horny, like just really so much more, everything got elevated to the extreme and it was completely not being supervised medically at all. Um, and so that was really bad for me. Um, I felt very out of control and reckless and I was still suicidal. So it just made me more impulsive and I was abusing drugs at the time. Um, and so it just that, it, that escalated that, you know, just giving a, five to female, you know, a very high dose of testosterone and she already has PCOS. So she already has like hormonal issues. And you're giving her these cross sex hormones that aren't meant for her body. You know, it's, it's really dangerous. And then I, uh, had a double mastectomy, uh, when I was 20. So that, um, is obviously a huge regret of mine. Um, like I'm at the point now where I have such acceptance over my body and being a woman and I'm so much more mentally stable that the thought of wanting to remove 
my breasts, if I had them today, it just seems incomprehensible to me. But at the time, you know, this was six years ago, at the time, I felt like I had no other option. And I didn't even want to be trans, to be honest with you, because being trans is not, it's not, the, it's not a fantasy. You know, there is a reality of that it's very difficult. It's very difficult to date. You know, it's very difficult to be gender nonconforming um, and medicalized. Can a person from one sex ever truly be the opposite sex? Do you feel? No, no. I mean, you obviously you can't really change sex. But what you can do is there are some people who have successfully um, altered their uh, appearance and physiology and behavior and integrated into society in a way where they present as the opposite sex. And so they can sort of flow, you know, with not, with, without resistance um, through society. Um, and for some people that is successful. So essentially you cannot change sex and, but you can, for some people, they can successfully do enough cosmetic procedures that, that they're able to uh, present as the opposite sex. Yeah, without a penis, it's gonna, did you ever feel like a, a man? I mean, I don't know really what it feels like to be a man, right? I can't ever really know that. In my mind, I had a fantasy of what a man would be, right? You know, based on porn, based on, you know, um, celebrities, you know, just, you can never really know what it's like to be the opposite sex unless you're physiologically experiencing that reality. Um, I do know what it's like to be in a higher level of testosterone. I know what it's like to have some male typical behavior, but ultimately I was a female with autism, PCOS and PTSD who had a um, magical thinking about becoming a gay man. And it was absolutely horrible. It was absolutely abysmal um, to identify as a gay man when you don't have a penis, when you don't have a male body. And I mean, I was miserable. I was, that's, I was so suicidal. I was just felt like I would never be loved because you know, what man would want to be with me? And um, I never did find any love from, any, from anything, straight men or gay men or bisexual men. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was really torturous um, to have this fantasy of escaping yourself and putting all this energy into this fantasy that's never gonna happen and being so upset over that versus doing really, really painful work to try and accept yourself as I eventually did, you know, um, but with obviously the added, the added trauma of basically self-harming, you know, the scars that I have from the double mastectomy, I view them as self-harm scars. It wasn't intentional self-harm, you know, the concept of it is that you're becoming your true self and that you're healing yourself and you're saving yourself from suicide. Um, but it, I just look at them now and I see self-harm scars because um, it's very destructive. And so, yeah, when I transitioned, I was just a very traumatized young woman who had her breasts removed. I wasn't any closer to being a man in any way. So the surgery and the hormones did not help. They made things much worse. I have PTSD as well from the identity crisis. Um, that's, it's really, that aspect of the PTSD, I will say, has been mostly resolved. Um, as some other stuff I'm still working on, the deeper wounds. Um, but I have done a lot of work on actually healing from the, the identity crisis. And when, and really the, there's a lot of shame to admit that, that you were naive and ignorant and foolish and even prideful and, and even arrogant in some ways that, that you could, you know, alter nature in this way and, um, so there's a lot of grief and acceptance work that comes with, you know, um, with detransitioning because you have to accept that you will never have a typical body. Like, you know, I'm an artist. It's very hard for me to have a disfigured part of my body, my natural sort of beautiful form. 
uh, you know, trying to create, I, as an artist, creating beauty everywhere and seeing beauty. And, and it's very hard to know that I, you know, disfigured myself um, in this way. And um, as well as psychologically, you know, knowing that you were that out of touch with reality is very terrifying, you know. And so it's taken a lot of, a lot of work to be able to ground myself in the here and now and reality and understand, um, you know, spiritually and philosophically, um, psychologically, physically, um, what I should be doing and what is unhealthy for me to do. And um, I'm still working on it too, but. What, what advice would you give to somebody who is struggling with issues like this, whether they're born male or female? Well, the, the key thing to know is that gender dysphoria can overlap with many other conditions and that there's many different treatment modalities for these symptoms besides medicalization. So you do not have to medicalize. You do not have to identify as transgender. There are many people I know who have gender dysphoria. They're not trans, they're not non-binary. They just have distress around their physiology and their um, social role. Usually um, homosexuals have that. Um, but uh, my advice would be look into alternative methods of treating gender dysphoria. Um, radical acceptance is, is the number one thing. It's also the most difficult thing. Um, I would say in general, if you're dealing with distress, you can't, especially self-hate um, or hopelessness, you cannot jump from negative to positive. You know, what you have to do is you have to reach a place of neutrality, which is very difficult, but it's sort of like a Buddhist concept, right? You have to try and get away from the duality of the good and bad and sort of reach a place of the gray area of neutrality and say, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not a worthless person. I'm not, a, you know, a worthy person. I exist and that is okay. You know, you have to spend a lot of time in that space before you can then move to, I am a worthy person. I am worthy enough. I am lovable enough. I am okay enough as my, in my body. My body is attractive enough, you know, but it's you, I think a lot of people miss the neutrality aspect of it. And what's your relationship like with your family now? Um, it's a lot better. Um, you know, I live, a, I'm out of the house. That's been really important, you know, just integrating, taking adult responsibility um, and living, um, having my own place. Um, I am in, con I'm in regular contact with them. We have a pretty good relationship. There's, you know, unfortunately still some emotional unavailability from them. I've done so much therapy, so much healing work, and I, I'm ready to have these conversations. I'm ready to to heal, even if it's excruciatingly painful, but they're not really ready to, to meet me there. So a lot of it is just me doing this by myself and with therapists and other friends going through the same thing. But ultimately it's a lot better. Um, I still have a lot of attachment wounds. I still have an insecure attachment style that comes from the abuse. So relationships um, thus far have not worked out. Um, there's been a lot of trauma around abusive relationships, romantic relationships, um, but I've done a lot of work on that. Um, but you know, that's still kind of the main thing I'm working on, those core attachment wounds, um, but it is getting a lot better. What's your biggest regret in this journey of yours? The biggest, uh, The nihilism. The nihilism is my biggest regret because, um, you know, basically, it, you know, having a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset, having such a destructive, um, pessimistic view of everything, of myself. You know, I've missed so many opportunities for happiness, for growth, for ex positive experience, for friendships, for um, self development because I was stuck in this trauma-based, you know, and it's not all my fault. I mean, it's a brain injury, but you know, that's my biggest regret is that for so long I was not living up to my potential 
and I was destroying myself, um, or at least living in limbo where I wasn't developing anything. And now I have such an excess amount of energy um, and it just all comes out in the form of grief and crying, you know, just so much love to give. And I was so isolated because I was too afraid to embrace my potential because I had a, you know, limiting beliefs that I wasn't worthy of love, you know? So that's, that's my biggest regret. Hmm. And what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? Ooh, um... Acceptance, um, which I understand acceptance can be a vague term, um, but like I said, you know, there always is the duality of right and wrong, action or non-action, you know, all these dualities. But it's sort of like I wear the yin and yang ring. That's a very important symbol to me because there always is the other side within whatever you're going through. So there always is still there always is beauty that still exists even when pain is present there always is um you know um potential new opportunities and abundance even within the void um and so just understanding less of a black and white thinking and understanding that you know zooming out into a more broad view instead of a myopic view having a larger perspective. Hmm. All right, Laura, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Good luck with the rest of your life as a woman. Thank you. Thank you very much.